Ladies and gentlemen, the JW Swing Band. G'day. I thought before we get right into the showing of what's been happening in the year 1984 in reference to the JW Swing Band, I thought I'd give a little bit of my own personal background in how it sort of became from an idea or a fantasy into uh, a more viable reality. It started, I remember, for me about 1964 or maybe 65, I would have been five or six years old, and Dad brought home this album of six records called The Swing Years. And he played it, and it reminded me of the, the music that I'd heard so often on the old movies, the uh, on ones on television, which soon I became quite interested in. And in seeing some of the old movies, I became quite obsessed in the whole swing era and became deeply in love with the music and the whole era of what it represented as far as music and style went. And often I see these films and I become entranced when I see them, the Glenn Miller movies, the Benny Goodman ones. And this kindled perhaps a dream for me to have my own band, which I started in 1974. Now the personnel seen on this film clip here is not the original 1974 personnel. The band was started in 74 as a request by my clarinet teacher to put together a band to play for a senior citizens uh, concert. The concert never came through but the idea of having a band was always a dream for me and so I kept the musicians that I'd managed to scrape together together and one by one eventually the personnel changed due to differences of opinion and just general changes of attitudes amongst other players. The personnel as seen here was what I could classify as the start of the good band. Having started the band in 74 I was 15 but by this stage I'd met uh, a number of very influential people in my life, namely the drummer in the clip here, Evan Loning, who was to stay with the band for many years and influence sound as well as me. Uh, uh, he eventually changed to trumpet, which you'll see in the next clip, and also piano, one of the finest and most intelligent musicians around today, I'd say. Also in that band is a uh, very famous <laughs> trombonist who's still with the band, Steve Jones. And another uh, inspiring musician who's not with the band anymore, Lance Henderson, who's on trumpet here, who eventually replaced the bass player, which was Anthony Cook, and he took on the bass chair for a number of years, and Lance was a very important person. Also, uh, another uh, again, important person is the sax player Mark Hallett with the uh, more protruding sort of uh, feature, i.e. his nose. Uh, and Mark was eventually to become a very fine musician, uh, a very fine jazz musician as well as a, a fine saxophonist and flute player. Now we've skipped from the year 1976 from the Mitchum High days where I got a lot of good charts to 1977 and here is the band outside the house of Evan Loning for a job we did and introducing here the 14 year old drummer Peter Neville. 1977 was also the year Andrew Lynn joined the band. He was just 15 and here he is seen with Rob Burns. Andrew has stayed with the band ever since. Here we are in 1979 and this was the final job because I decided to quit that year 
having been let down too many times by musicians and as you can see the band has expanded quite a lot the tall chap on the right of course is young baby Andrew Lynn the theme by the way was Boogie Woogie Opus To this very day I don't understand what drives me to this fanatic love for swing music. All I know is that I can still put on a set of headphones today and tune into a, a recording of a broadcast and become immediately transported back to the time which I feel that I've been dearly conned out of existing through. So that's probably what drives me to make up for the fact that I wasn't there to create my own world where I can live and love swing music. From beautiful casino gardens in Ocean Park, California, One Night Stand brings you Tommy Dorsey and his orchestra with Lucy Ann Polk, Stuart Foster, and the town crier. Here's Benny Goodman's theme, Let's Dance. together. The National Broadcasting Company on the one side, and Artie Shaw and his sensational orchestra and clarinet on the other. Famous saxophonist Jimmy Dorsey and his orchestra in contrasting music. The National Broadcasting Company invites you to listen to Glenn Miller's music. Much of the um, early years, i.e. 1974, were pretty frustrating because we were all kids. I was about 15. Most of us didn't take much seriousness in it, except for myself, which I was crazy about the music. And for many years after that, I had trouble with people who mucked around too much, or musicians who weren't in it for the music. They were in it for the money, which wasn't a lot anyhow. So I gave up in 1980, and then in 1982, I put together a band of some of the old musicians, some of the good ones, like Andrew Lynn, and some of the new ones, like Adrian Daff and Roy Gillett, Jeff Orr, and they've made now the band that you're going to be seeing quite a bit of, the JW Swing Band. Well, here we are, December 10, 1982. The all-new JW Swing Band, including vocalist Jeff Orr. Hollywood Party. <laughs>
I think it was. Uh, it was a lot of fun and I found it excellent musical training, I must say. As I got interested in different things, I was able to sort of incorporate them into John's band. I did a couple of arrangements and that was a wonderful experience because very rarely do you actually get the opportunity to write for a big ensemble like that and have charts played and uh, worked over. I also got interested in this side of things. I started off playing drums and then picked up all the tunes from here. And we even managed to get this very set of vibes along to a job, I think, once upon a time. So John was very kind in fostering all those different interests. Um, I learned so much about music in general, which has passed off into life in other ways and into my career. And just knowing all those tunes that we play has helped a lot. When you come across them in a particular gig, you know the style, you know what you're playing, and that was really wonderful experience to learn all that. Uh, eventually, the love of all these things took over. I moved more into classical music, but I still love jazz. And my time became very, shall we say, unreliable. And John, unfortunately, had to find somebody else to play drums. But I think he's got a wonderful replacement. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, Peter Neville was in fact 14 when he joined the band and when he did his final job in the middle of 1983, he was 20 in fact. The Hollywood party, which was a private party which I hired the band for, was a great stepping stone for this fresh young band and we soon had to improve greatly for the jobs that lay ahead. The person who replaced Peter Neville in, towards the end of 1983 was young 19-year-old John Schmidley. Here we are in 1984, early 84, preparing and rehearsing for the jobs that lay ahead. In 1983 we'd lost bass player Roger Perrin and replaced him with bass player Tim Palmer. And in 1984 one of my own students and protégés, Kevin Morrow, joined the band too.
in the state of Carolina. If there is, then you know her. So to me, Dinah, with your Dixie eyes blazing, I would love to sit and gaze in to the eyes of Dinah Lee. Now every night, why do I shake with fright? Because my Dinah mind change her mind about me. Ooh, Dinah, if you wanted to China, I would hop an ocean liner just to be with Dinah Lee. 